Welcome to the Ponderings Podcast. This is your host, Milo, and in this episode, I'm going to be talking about Henry Bergson and his philosophy on time and free will. This is the fourth spooky cast episode. It's not really that spooky, but it's done in the month of October, so that must count for something, right? Um, this podcast can be accessed on several podcast hosting sites such as Apple Podcasts, Anchor, Spotify, etc. Um, there's also a YouTube channel for the Ponderings podcast where you can find all these episodes. Um, this will be a brief introduction to Henry Burson's philosophy of time and free will um, or freedom, and then I'll at the end compare it to Alfred North Whitehead, of course. So who is Henry Bergson? Henry Bergson is a French philosopher born in Paris, 1859 to 1941. He has influenced philosophers such as Merleau-Ponty, Sartre, and Gilles Deleuze. Uh, He's similar to Whitehead in that what he wanted to happen when he died He wanted his wife to throw away all his papers, so, you know, they'd be destroyed once he died. And Whitehead also commanded the same thing. And that's probably why he's not as well-known, because there wasn't all these archives and things left. Only his writings, only his published writings. Um, He's also similar to Whitehead um, in that he was originally a mathematician who eventually became a philosopher. So you'll see some uh, parallels between Whitehead's um, philosophy of organism and Henry Bergson's philosophy. Um, They both are uh, process philosophers, and they both refute uh, substance ontology. All right, so to begin, I'll start by uh, elaborating on Henry Bergson's concept of multiplicity. This concept of multiplicity can be found to originate in phenomenology and also in Bergson. Um, In phenomenology, multiplicity is related to a unified consciousness. Um, So think about uh, being in the world, Heidegger. uh, It's that first person point of view. It's an intentional experience directed towards something or about something. Um, Phenomenology is the study of uh, like experience, how we experience things not really about what we're experiencing but like how we're experiencing it uh the fact that we're situated in a body that is in a world all this is important to phenomenology the only thing is phenomenology focuses on like a it's a unified consciousness and for Bergson multiplicity refers to the immediate data of consciousness so it's similar to phenomenology. Phenomenology is focusing on that, uh, the phenomena, how we experience things directly. Um, But the difference here is that the immediate data of consciousness is not unified for Bergson. It's a multiplicity. So I'll um, elaborate on that further. But this concept of multiplicity is sort of the main topic in his book Time and Free Will, where he sort of attacks Kant's notion of freedom. Um, And for Kant, uh, the notion of freedom for him belongs to a realm outside of space and time. So Bergson believes that Kant is sort of confused about space and time. Uh, Kant conceives human action as determined by natural causality. So natural causality, that's the genetic connection of phenomena through which one thing, the cause, under certain conditions, gives rise to the effect. So it's cause and effect. Um, And the determinism is the doctrine that all events are ultimately set in stone by causes external to the will. So individual human beings have no free will in a deterministic universe. So put it simply, all natural events occur in time and are thoroughly determined by causal chains chains that stretch backwards into the distant past. So there's no room for freedom in nature, in sort of Kant's uh, view of space and time and how causality plays out. Like there's no, there's no um, creation or evolution that is happening in this sort of type of causality, the, the natural 
and determined causality. It's set in stone through the, the past events. So Bergson has a twofold response to Kant. First, Bergson proposes to dif differentiate time and space. Second, he defines the immediate data of consciousness as being temporal, as duration. In this duration, there is no juxtaposition of events, so no mechanistic ca uh, causality. Um, so in the duration itself is the experience of freedom. So again, with Kant, it's a mechanistic causality because there are juxtaposition of events, because it's for Kant, it's a substance ontology. And I'll get more into that as I go along. So so what does he mean, um, Bergson? What does Bergson mean by duration? Duration, he sees it as having to do with time. Duration is temporal. Um, he has two different types of multiplicity that he sort of lays out and explains. So there's the qualitative multiplicity, and then there's the quantitative multiplicity. The qualitative is what Bergson is sort of advocating for, and then the quantitative would be substance, um, substance ontology, things like that, which Kant would be advocating for. So again, quant qualitative process and quantitative substance. Uh, so substance would refer to um, being able to uh, number things or number the states of consciousness by externalizing one from the other in the same space. So it's the ability to juxtapose two different substances. They're in the same space, but you tell them apart by differentiating them through, um, like they're two different things. Uh, so what Bergson aligns with is more of a process ontology. There are several conscious states that are organized into a whole and they permeate one another. Um, they gradually gain a richer content. So it's a sort of creative advance. Um, but again, s several should not be taken to signify the act of numbering. So even though it's several conscious states, the point here is not to number. It's just to know that there are a multiplicity of states. It's a process. There aren't any substances or objects or things. They're all kind of entangled, enmeshed kind of thing. So, for example, uh, Bergson uh, comes up with this example to explain quantitative multiplicity. Uh, he uses the flock of sheep. So, when we look at a flock of sheep, we notice that they all look alike. Um, we are not able to sense a qualitative change as we move from one, like one sheep to the other. And we are able to number the sheep, uh, specifically because the sheep are spatially separated. Or juxtaposed from the others. So each sheep occupies a distinct spatial location. And because we can sense a spatial location and unity within a substance, so because we can sense that a sheep has a unity, or it seems like it has a unity and it's like uh, taking space, it can be represented with a symbol or number. So that would be quantitative multiplicity. We're sort of breaking things down into symbols, images, numbers, representations. So the main difference between quantitative substance multiplicity and qualitative process multiplicity is that there is no juxtaposition in the qualitative multiplicity. Um, an example is feelings are continuous with one another. We can use the example of the feeling of pity to... Um, illustrate a qualitative progress from one feeling to another. This feeling of pity transitions from repugnance to fear, from fear to sympathy, and from sympathy to humility. Um, these feelings cannot be juxtaposed or separated from each other. They cannot be adequately represented by a symbol because qualitative multiplicities are inexpressible. So yeah, there's, you know, we know what sympathy is, we know what fear is, we know what uh, repugnance is, and we are able to separate these out with the use of language, but in actuality, in reality, it's they're very interconnected and they can't be abstracted from the other feelings. Feelings give rise to other feelings, which give rise to other feelings. As babies, 
just to put it as an example, we have rudimentary sort of feelings and then they sort of complexify or they get more complex as we get older because they've built on past experiences, past feelings, um, things are more complex. Feelings, they go through a sort of evolution. But yeah, they cannot be adequately represented by a symbol. And that's sort of what Berkson is trying to get at that, okay, with the use of language, we can, you know, compartmentalize and say this is that, and that's a substance, this is this, um, those are sheep. But there, there's a lot more complexity going on, and space and time aren't something out there. Space and time is something integral to all of creation, like all of the universe. And it's something that is in constant movement. So for Bergson, freedom is this temporal progress. It's mobility. As we grow older, our future grows smaller and our past larger. It represents a continuity of experience without juxtaposition. We can think about our past as like events. We can remember these events, but they can't be abstracted from the whole. Uh, duration implies a conservation of the past. So time sort of serves as this. We conserve the past in order to create more complex or novel complexities in the present and in the future. So memory for Bergson conserves the past and allows for difference in present experiences. And this difference allows for freedom because we're able to have choice and create. We're in the process of becoming. So duration is memory. It's the prolongation of the past into the present. And then this present creates new configurations of, you know, the immediate uh, data of consciousness. And then that becomes a part of the past and joins the whole large scope history of the past, which continues to move into the present and sort of be unified in this complexity. Growth. Another example that Bergson illustrates to um, so that we can understand this qualitative multiplicity a little better is for us to picture an elastic band being stretched by first imagining a point for the band to having it like stretch from that point. And that point will be the now of the experience. So just imagine a, a, an elastic band being stretched um, so then you draw it out to make the line progressively longer, but focus on the action, the movement, not the line itself. So on the action of tracing the movement, which is duration, we notice that it's continuous and it's differentiating. It differentiates itself from other points on the line, but it's still part of that movement. It's indivisible. So we can always insert breaks into the line, right? Into that spatial line that represents motion, but the motion itself is indivisible. So that motion can't be divided. It's always gonna be like moving forward. So it's always gonna be expanding. So yeah, we can divide the moments of the line, but we cannot divide the movement itself. It just continues. For, for Bergson, there is a priority of movement over the things that move. So the thing that moves is an, abs is an abstraction from the movement. The image of the elastic band is still incomplete because no image can truly represent duration. An image will always be a static substance, whereas duration is pure mobility, it's pure process. So here he's trying to get at the fact that it's inexpressible. We can't explain how process is just always occurring and it's always, it, that being is always in this process of becoming. It's always in this duration, this pure mobility. And we can divide the band or the, you know, the, we can compartmentalize. We can uh, label the past into different events and things like that. But when we're talking about the process itself, when we're talking about the movement itself, that can't be divided and things can't be abstracted from it. So in that case, um, Bergson can be uh, compared to Whitehead. They're very similar. Whitehead talked about this creative advance and Bergson, um, he wrote 
some books about creativity and the creative mind and the creative evolution and they're both sort of trying to get at this process ontology this process um way of existing that things aren't static substances yeah science and math these disciplines objectify the environment and things in order to learn more about it but they're sort of abstracting from the phenomena the actual phenomena the actual phenomena can't be quantified it's sort of just it's qualitative it's phenomenal phenomenological it's an experience um for whitehead he had this term called concrescence uh which means the production of novel togetherness. This goes to explain again how the present is always building up on the past, on this historical route that's sort of continuing to intensify and complexify. The creative evolution is always moving forward towards greater experiences of intensity and complexity. This gives us freedom. This gives us choice and movement. There's some type of determination because we have a past, we have a history that we're sort of building upon, but there's freedom in the fact that there, it isn't predetermined. There isn't just like a fate. Um, There are choices, there are possibilities, potentials. So these are philosophies built on possibility. I hope that this podcast episode has helped you Um, understand a little more about Bergson's philosophy and also how it can relate to um, Alfred North Whitehead. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you next time.